We're going to talk about what's coming up in, in what we think is coming in the livestock and poultry markets and the grain market. Obviously very important to us. And then of course we want to talk about in specific uh, what's going on in hogs. I think the really key drivers of this year, number one as it's been for the last couple years is input prices and production costs and it really boils down to a little, about three or four questions. You know, will it rain? Where will it rain? When will it rain? How much will it rain? I mean, it, it really boils down to the growing season this year after what we went through last year. And finally, the one that we all tend to forget about is if it hadn't been so blaming hot last summer, we probably wouldn't have been in the mess that we're in even with the, uh, the shortness of, of moisture we had. We had heat at the wrong time in lots of places and it really had a big impact. Second one, how will pork and hog demand hold up? Uh, I think there's several factors, obviously, that we're going to look at here that are going to be critical. The U.S. economy and consumer spending is an important one. Uh, interestingly, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, if you look at meat demand and measures of meat demand, they've actually bailed up pretty well this last year in spite of an economy that has not been very robust at all. The second one, of course, is the world economy and what's that going to say about exports and exchange rates. And finally, the prices of competitor goods, especially beef, are going to be a big factor as we go through 2013. And finally, just how many hogs will we see and how, how big will they be? Obviously supply is a big deal and we looked at the December hogs and pigs report and uh, there was some surprises there for some folks. Now I would say if you watch the data pretty closely as we went through the fall you shouldn't have been too surprised by that because we never did slaughter enough sows and we certainly didn't slaughter enough gilts to try to get this breeding herd very much smaller if any smaller at all. How long will these weights stay relatively low? That's the other question and it's really mitigating some increases in slaughter at the present time. And finally, what's going to happen with packer margins and capacity? I think we're going to be okay on that. I was very concerned about the fall of 2013, six or eight months ago, about what we might get if we went into an expansion, which we'd started into at the beginning of 2012. Uh, I don't think we're going to be in that bad a shape at this point, uh, but uh, we certainly are in a situation where if this business is going to grow in the future, and we have a larger population, we have a larger world population that needs more product, uh, we're going to need another packing plant in the United States at some point over the next two or three years, and I'm not sure where we're going to put that. Okay, let's talk about costs. Last April, after I was here in lay in January and then we went through the spring, uh, as we looked at the situation in the United States, we were very concerned about all of you southern Minnesotans because it was a little dry here. And of course in May it started raining in southern Minnesota and many of you got very nice rains and ended up with some of the best crops in the country because everybody else went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, it was really bad. And, I mean, this is the worst drought we've had certainly since 1988. And uh, uh, it stretched all the way across the Corn Belt uh, with terrible conditions in southern Indiana and southern Illinois where they had extremely low uh, um, uh, yields. Now, if we look at where we are today, the eastern Corn Belt is in pretty good shape. As a matter of fact, I talked to a friend of mine from Ohio last week. They've had 20 inches plus rain since August. I mean, there's plenty of moisture in the eastern Corn Belt. Iowa and Missouri are better, uh, certainly not good yet, but better. And, but the real problem is in the, the, the high plains, the Great Plains. And that has much more impact really on the beef business, I think, than it does on us. But still, uh, there's a few acres of corn in Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, Southwest Minnesota that are going to have to have rain this spring. Uh, some people have said, well, how did producers hold on? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, I said number one is they've kind of bet all their dollars on this situation that it's going to be raining this year. And I think it's going to be very critical uh, that we get timely rains or we get some rain before spring. Now, we'll talk in a little bit about what's needed to kind of catch up, but the result of course, and you're probably very aware of this, uh, the lowest uh, yield we've had since back in 1991, uh, it was 22% below the 1960 uh, to, to, to date trend almost 25% below the, uh, the biotech trend that dates back to 1996. If we throw this observation in, the new trend line is the green one. And so the trend yield for the coming year would be in the high 150s somewhere in that range. Uh, you know, where will we be? And that's, you're going to hear a lot of talk about what trend yield actually is, since most people say that the trend is there to capture gains in technology and that you shouldn't really affect the trend much when you got bad weather. Well, I tend to disagree and that's one of the reasons I like the 1960 trend is it goes through a variety of weather years. Um, I had somebody say uh, to me last fall, it says, boy, those, 
those drought genetics that those corn breeders put in, man, they didn't do us much good. And I said, oh, don't say that. I mean, you may have been in a whole lot worse shape with what we had last year had those kind of genetic traits not been present. On the soybean side, of course, not nearly the impact there, 39.6, still the largest deviation from trend since 2003, I believe that was, and about 10% below the trend relative to the 1988 drought when we were 18% down. Last week's WASDE report uh, contained a few surprises. And on the corn side, the big surprise was this number right here. Uh, when USDA marked up their estimates of feed and residual use by 300 million bushels. Now, that was a surprise to the market, and, and, and I guess I, it was a surprise to me to some degree because I couldn't hardly believe USDA actually did it. Uh, because I had been looking at animal numbers for some time and raising the question, how are we going to get to 4.15 billion? I could not see how we could get there. It's not a matter of whether you wanted to reduce feed, uh, feed uh, intakes. It's a matter of how quickly can livestock and poultry producers adjust. And it just didn't look to me like it was possible. Well, USDA moved that number up. They dropped 200 million off of exports. And still that drew carryout stocks down to 602 million bushels at the end of the marketing year. Only 5.3% of total usage. That's second lowest on both counts uh, that we have on record. The other one was in 1995. They didn't change their price forecast at all. And one of the reasons is, of course, the markets had really traded down toward the bottom end of their range before. So it's kind of an effective increase in that one. If we look at usages, you can see all of them are lower. Here's total feed and residual plus DDGS up here. And that goes down again this year. Had we had a good crop, that number would have actually gone up as far as feed availability. But you can see the trend of feed availability from corn sources is still down. And that means that we're going to have to live with that probably. Now, what happens this year? Well, uh, 96, 98, 100 million acres of corn. Take your pick at 150 some bushels per acre. And you, uh, you harvest 90 to 92 percent of it and you've got a 14.5, you know, bumping 15 billion bushel corn crop, uh, you could increase all of these uses and we would have prices that are far more reasonable than what we've seen. Here's that relationship between the animal number feed, uh, implied feed usage and what USDA said going into the report. Of course, they have now increased that up to 4.45 billion bushels, so it's about uh, aligned. Uh, if we look at the implications of the animals themselves on this feeding situation, we have to remember that this thing turns very, very slowly. I mean, if you slaughter beef cows, you don't save any grain. If you slaughter a dairy cow, you do save some grain, and we certainly started that in the summertime, uh, as, as also not only do they save feed costs, but it has a positive impact on milk prices. All cattle are caught between this high grain price and poor hay and pasture situation. I was in Oklahoma where I grew up uh, over Christmas and uh, I was telling uh, Don Close with Rabobank before the meeting here, I said, you know, there's a lot of places down there that look pretty much like a pool table. I mean, they have grazed it right in the ground trying to keep these cows and what they've done is used the pasture for the cows and the calves had had to be placed. I mean, they put in some kind of backgrounding lot, feed lots during the fall and even at that rate, our placements are well below a year ago. And so, uh, you know, they're really caught in this situation. Sow slaughter saves very little feed for six months. Uh, I mean, until her pigs aren't there, uh, you're only saving that half a ton of feed she would eat in that six month period. And then even at that, we didn't reduce the sow herd. So we didn't save feed that way. Chicken and turkeys can respond fast, and they have. Uh, the chicken business has certainly cut back on the breeder flock. We'll talk about that, but they've already turned the corner. And I think they're already looking toward this year with very strong uh, part prices and probably are going to increase uh, their output. Corn stocks, if we look at the December 1 corn stocks, the lowest inventory of corn since 2004 and the, a very high rate of feed usage during the Sepnov quarter was what really caused that, that reduction uh, or that increase on feed usage. Uh, we've just got very tight stocks going into this year and I think we're going to see uh, these things get very, very tight indeed as we get into the summer. Uh, there haven't been very many responses in terms of weights. The only one of the four major species whose market weights have responded to these higher feed costs and 
and losses has been hogs. And we made that adjustment back in August and September. It caused quite a flood of pigs for a while, as we know, because you have to pull those down. You ought to move pigs faster. But look where average steer weights are. And if you looked at a heifer chart, it looked just the same, just the scaling would be different. Uh, average broiler weights, by the way, this one, in my opinion, is driven by a technological advance. It's uh, the impact of Zilmax and Optiflex and what it has had on the marginal cost, marginal revenue uh, equation of those calves as they go in that last 30 days of feeding. And it said, keep feeding them. And they put more and more weight on these these cattle, you know, 875 for the average carcass weight basically in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, average broiler weights have gone up as well, and you can see they really went up in the fall. And that is not so much that they're feeding all the chickens heavier, it's just a shift in the chicken business away from smaller birds for parts to larger birds basically for boning. And that trend, according to Paul Ajo with uh, Poultry Perspectives in Connecticut, he thinks that that has really just started. He says that's going to continue for the next four or five years because it just makes more money to raise big birds. I told him, I said, yep, I've come out of a business that knows exactly what that is. I mean, that's the reason we've raised bigger and bigger hogs is because they make more money on the farm and they make more money for the packer. And so uh, there's a very strong incentive to do that. On the turkey side, the same thing is true. More and more large boning birds, especially to go into processed products. Okay, let's get away from the feed and residual aspects. Uh, obviously, my conclusion is I think USD is absolutely right on with their increase in feed and residual usage. I thought they were too low for some time, and this adjustment puts them right in the ballpark where I figured they were going to have to be. The renewable fuel standard uh, goes up this year to 13.8 billion gallons for this year is the requirement. Now, if we wait a few months at 13.2 and or four months there and eight months there, we get a, for the crop year uh, about 13.6 billion or roughly 4.9 billion bushels of corn. The question is, A, how many RINs are out there, the credits for past blending of ethanol, and B, how many of them are going to be cashed in this year? I mean, uh, there's, uh, you know, number one is you don't want to blend ethanol if it's not profitable. But you also don't want to use RINs up when you're looking at a, a, another increase in the renewable fuel standard in 2014 and 2015. And you have this little inconvenient truth. I can't believe I said something about, that Al Gore said. Uh, uh, this little inconvenient truth that gasoline usage is going down. So we're requiring to blend more ethanol into less gasoline. That's kind of a problem. I think it could be a real catch at some point. And if that's the case, you may need some RINs to use against that standard in future years. So the question is how many are going to be used? We think there's about two to two and a half billion gallons worth of them out there. USDA's forecast use for ethanol this coming uh, crop year would say that they're going to use up about half of them. And they're going to have to use about half of them to satisfy that. And, and, you know, even at that, uh, we've had lower ethanol production because if you look at uh, where they are on margin over variable costs, I mean, the red is what you spend for corn, this is other cash costs, and the blue would be marginal, margin over variable costs. You can see what happened when the blender's tax credit went away, and that thing has gotten very, very tight indeed since last summer. And so what's happened? Well, not all ethanol plants, just like not all hog farms, are created equal, and some were higher cost and they've closed down. And of course, these margins that we look at right now, this is as of last week, if you're only getting 15 pounds of DDGS, you're losing about 30 cents relative to variable costs. The question always comes up, how much does spending the oil add to this? 10, maybe 15 cents on a bushel basis is what I understand from Dr. Wisner at Iowa State. So even that won't get you back on, positive, on a positive uh, uh, yield here over variable cost in an ethanol plant. So what's happened? Well, ethanol production has dropped. It's averaged about 34 million gallons per day since July. Uh, that seems to be the rate. There's the first year of what, week of this year, at about 34.6 million uh, gallons. If they continue this average of 34.2 for this year, they'll use 4.47 billion and of course, USDA's forecast right now is 4.5. So that's exactly where USDA thinks they're going to be. And that would be somewhere in the range of about, uh, uh, for the first part of the year, about 10% lower than a year ago. And then, of course, equal to last year for the second part. 
Corn is still well ahead of oil if we look at the prices over time and we can see that this kind of correlation began really in 2006 and 7 and corn has followed oil pretty well. Big divergence recently, but notice how we've had some reconciliation of that over the last six months. And it's going to continue because when there's that big a difference, it creates a huge incentive for acres on corn. And we're going to see more corn acres and I, at some point we're going to see these prices come back together. Now, you can't do that immediately with corn because you've got to have more supply to cause it, but we'll see these come back together. It doesn't look like, you know, one of, the, one of the risks to any forecast these days when you talk about grains and by extension livestock is what happens to oil prices. I mean, uh, you know, oil prices could go, uh, go up in a, in a hurry should we have some trouble in the Middle East, but we have been steadily increasing oil production here in the U.S. and certainly we've found kind of a, an equilibrium range here somewhere between, you know, 80 and 100 dollars, somewhere in that range for oil, and I think no, that's probably going to catch it, barring any unforeseen circumstances in the coming year. That's kind of that's where we're assuming the oil is going to stay somewhere in that range. Cash corn uh, futures, as of yesterday, a big break. Of course, in the summer futures, about a dollar as you go to the September contract, and uh, that means a big savings for corn prices. But you can see where we are. A good crop, though, next year if we do the math. Like I say, 100 million acres. Uh, 91 or two of it uh, harvested. If you get a trend yield of 150 to 160 bushels, uh, you've got 14, 5, pushing 15 billion bushels of corn. Uh, you could get carryouts well above a billion bushels again, I think, even by the end of 2014. And I think we would see prices back down below $5 and possibly well below. We're going to be in the same shape we were a year ago. Uh, those of you who heard me talk at World Pork Expo, I said, you know, if it rains, we got corn in the fours. If it doesn't rain, we have corn in the eights. Everyone heard the first part, and nobody heard the second part. Okay, but that's exactly the knife edge we were on then. It's the knife edge we're on now. Get used to it. It's the knife edge we're probably going to be on virtually every year, given the usage base that we have at this point. DDGS have finally come back into some of your diets. They spent a good portion of last year more expensive uh, than what most uh, hog diets could handle. Uh, the uh, cattle business obviously turns to DGS and can use them better than we can from a nutri nutrient standpoint. Uh, so I think you, you will get some break this year, but you have to remember that with much lower ethanol production, the supply of those DDGS are going to be quite, uh, quite tight and uh, some, some area is going to be very, very hard to find. On the soybean side, the uh, January WASDE on soybeans, um, not any real huge changes, a little bit of an increase in the, in the yield, which increased the crop a bit, uh, some higher, but here's the number that really kind of shook that one too, and guess what? It has to do with feed usage. Crushing's up uh, about 30 million bushels uh, as we go through uh, this year. Uh, if we trace that on down, they didn't change exports at all. Uh, they did change a little bit on residual, so that we had a, a little bit of an increase in, uh, in the carryout stocks. Of course, the real thing that's happening on the soybean side right now is watching what's going on in South America. Uh, that still looks pretty good. Argentina has some question marks. Uh, they had been very wet, and now uh, apparently uh, in many areas we're seeing some hotter, drier conditions. There's some concern about shallow root systems and what that might have. Uh, USDA, not USDS, uh, lowered uh, their yield estimate on Argentina, but uh, this crop still looks good, uh, about 35% larger than last year at 54 million metric tons. Brazil, uh, the biggest concern there really is logistics. I mean, uh, they're going to have a crop that will almost certainly be larger than the U.S. crop for the first time ever. And uh, if that's the case, uh, then with 82.5 million metric tons, up 24%, uh, there's going to be some challenges in getting those beans to the water and uh, to get to export markets around the world. Uh, and one of the real things that's helping here is the real has weakened pretty dramatically and it makes them very, very competitive in world markets. Record acres and yields on the early harvest uh, are, are above average. So it looks like a good crop coming from there. So we should get some help on soybeans. And we've seen meal drop dramatically uh, over the last four months uh, since September. It shouldn't be a surprise that we kind of bounced off this, right, uh, this support right here at 396 because we had a number of supports uh, of trend lines that were converging there. 
Uh, it's gone up to about 415 here in the last few weeks. This is the, uh, this would be the March, February contract. Uh, up to about 415. I think we're going to test this, this support line several times here as we go through the spring. And I'd say that 396 support is going to be really the key. If you break below that, uh, there's not much down until you get down here in the low 300s for support. I would be surprised if we did that, to tell you the truth. But uh, a very good South American crop could have that kind of impact on the meal market. What's it going to take to recover? Well, this was the situation in, uh, at the end of September, right? Kind of as we went into harvest, uh, as far as how many inches of rain were needed to get the Palmer drought index back to a minus 0.5, which is basically neutral. And you can see that Iowa is very dry. There are a lot of areas with 12 inches of rain. One, uh, one uh, uh, district there with over 15 inches of rain needed. Uh, much of the Midwest needed 9 to 12 inches. Here's that map from last week. Uh, it's gotten quite a bit better. I mean, we're getting better. But still, uh, you've got much of the Corn Belt, the Western Corn Belt, that needs anywhere from three to six inches of moisture uh, to get back to a Palmer Drought Index that's, ne that's neutral. And so uh, there's still got to be a lot. Uh, as I told somebody, this, these, some of these numbers were nine inches in last month's uh, chart from, from the Weather Service. And I told them, I said, I sure hope it doesn't snow in Iowa that much. That's for sure, because this would take a lot of snowfall. Uh, it's going to need to rain at the right times as we get into the spring. I, I mean, that's just the only conclusion you can come up with. Uh, I know I live in central Iowa. Uh, the, the Raccoon River, which drains much of northwest Iowa, runs right through my hometown. It's still one, at the, maybe the lowest level it's been since I've been there for 20 years. And so there's not much water running. And uh, we're going to have to have timely rains as we go through this year. What does it mean about cost? Well, for hog costs, this is uh, based on the Iowa State uh, estimated cost and returns model. Um, as of this morning, um, those futures would say that break evens for this year would be about 93.86 on average, with a much lower break evens down into the mid 80s by the end of the year. Uh, that would be record high, up uh, a little over three dollars from last year and up about $7 from 2011. If we put that against hog prices for uh, the coming year with an Iowa basis built into those, uh, forecast 2013 profits are minus 722. And just two weeks ago, that number was minus 180 something. Okay, so higher grain prices. Uh, the sell-off that we saw in midweek last week in hog futures have certainly taken uh, some of this the, the luster and I can't say there's much luster with a loss of $2 for the year, uh, but still, it's certainly made it worse over the last couple of weeks. Now, what's going to happen here as we go forward? I, I, I think what we're going to see is I'm still concerned that corn prices aren't done. I think we're going to see corn prices trade up as we go through the spring because that crop is very tight. Um, I've been telling hog producers since August that I would not get to March without knowing where the corn for June, July, and August is. I mean, have it in a bin somewhere. Know where it is. Because it doesn't matter if you've got the price locked in. If the basis goes nuts on you and you can't find corn, you're in a world of hurt. So uh, I would be looking to try to get the corn supplies I need uh, going into the spring. Now, we're sitting in January. A normal kind of seasonal spring rally, cash rally on hogs could take these summer futures up and help us some. But if we look relative to supplies that we'll talk about in a moment, I think we're going to have some pressure on these, and I don't know that we're going to have these hogs trading up at above $100 like we had on the futures uh, just a few weeks ago. I don't have any $100 hogs in there in my summer forecast at the present time. So if we look at it another way, uh, losses, uh, certainly a, a serious situation, not as bad as 09, 2009 and 10. It's not the Armageddon that some were talking about last summer, certainly not a good situation, but not nearly what we've been through in the past. Okay. Demand, domestic and export. The world economy, economic situation is getting relatively better except for Europe. I mean, Europe is still stuck in a recession. Um, they're going to be there for a while. They haven't solved all of those uh, uh, sovereign debt problems. Uh, Spain is still at some, ish, uh, some risk. And uh, if Spain fails, uh, again, uh, if that gets negative again, uh, it will make Greece and the others look pretty, pretty immaterial because Spain is such a much larger 
uh, economy than the others. Uh, China, uh, classified by Moody's, is in an expansion now, as is Brazil, which was at risk in their, their ratings last summer. Uh, the United States still at some risk. Uh, this, would have been, this was in, in August. Pardon me. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. Here's where we are now. The United States in recovery. So is Brazil. So is China. Uh, the at-risk uh, tag has been taken off. You can see some improvement even in those European countries, but still a lot of red there showing uh, recession uh, conditions still are, are really dominant. On the U.S. side, the economy kind of bumps along. I mean, we haven't had any robust growth. Uh, muddles along here between one and two, uh, you know one and two percent on an annual basis, one half and one percent here on quarterly. Uh, the last most recent uh, quarter at just about eight tenths of one percent. Nothing to write home about. My biggest concern on the macro side continues to be this measurement. This is real per capita disposable income, uh, real personal disposable income per capita, and it's just not growing. Now the November observation comes in at least on the initial estimate by the Commerce Department at 1.8 percent. That's not bad, but it's still short of where we were back before the recession when we averaged over 2 percent. And that number came in with a slew of revisions that took all of the numbers for the, for the first part of this year down by 2 to 3 tenths of 1 percent. Uh, you know, you can't expect a robust economy if folks don't have money to spend. And, uh, you know, if you start raising taxes, guess what happens to per disposable income? It goes down. This is the after-tax pay variable of macroeconomics. And so I'm still concerned about that number, and I think it's got to get back to some more robust growth rates before we see a lot of, uh, a lot of help on the demand side. Now, uh, this is borne out in what's going on with restaurants. This is the Restaurant Performance Index. They had a nice recovery going in 2011. It really started cooking in the spring, and it's just falling apart. Uh, the last three months have been below 100. That says that that sector is, is contracting. Uh, there's no, you know, the, there's not much optimism there. I've always said, you know, used to the expectations component of this index ran well ahead of the actual, which showed that they were, the restaurant guys were even more optimists than farmers. Uh, but now they're about even. They just don't kind of muddle along. Uh, they've had some real challenges with traffic. Now that's the bad side of the demand picture. The good side is this one. If we look at monthly real per capita expenditures on the different species, we had a great month in November. I mean, September was terrific. October was a little bit slow. But look what happened in November. Uh, uh, well above last year, somewhat above last year, and well above the five-year average. Beef, uh, a big rebound uh, during the month of November, driven mainly by uh, much higher per capita beef consumption, 4.4% uh, relative to a year ago. Uh, chicken, uh, also much higher than a year ago. Really, that's more of an indictment of what happened to their uh, expenditures in November and December last year, but still 6% higher chicken prices. And remember, when you get that kind of kick in prices, that has a positive impact on pork demand eventually. Uh, and then, of course, on pork, uh, this was really driven by a 4% increase in per capita consumption uh, during November. Now, we always need to remember that per capita consumption here is a residual of production less all the other uses that we know where it went. Okay? Consumption as we measure it in these things is what's left over after we account for exports and imports and beginning and end of the inventories and production. So one of the reasons that pork demand looks so good is in the fall of the year when we're producing much more pork, consumers eat more and we don't have to discount the price a lot to get that done. And that's the reason pork demand is strong in the fourth quarter. The fallacy, you know, we've always said a lot, of, you hear a lot of people say, oh, well, demand will pick up when the summer gets here and people get out those grills. Well, actually, what happens is prices go up because we just don't bring them nearly as much pork as we don't normally do at other times of the year. And so that's, it's not demand at all, it's just a supply driven thing. But still, the point to be made here is uh, we certainly have had a good uh, fall for demand. And if we look at these in terms of demand indexes, that November performance put all four of the indexes for the last 12 month period from December of 2011 through November 2012 above zero. If that holds for another month, that'd be the first time we've ever had all the indexes go up in one year. Now, none of them are terribly robust with the largest one being beef at up 2%. But though, to have all four demand indexes plus I, I think it's pretty remarkable given that we haven't had a very strong economy uh, as we've gone through this last year. 
Uh, what's going on with this? Well, um, you know, I had a guy from the New York Times called last spring, and he was doing a story, and his story was about why Americans are reducing the amount of meat they want to they eat because they just don't want to eat meat anymore. And I said, well, I don't. Well, I agree that they're reducing their consumption, but it's not the fact that they don't want to eat meat, it's that they can't afford to eat meat anymore. Oh, you can't believe that. And I said, well, look at it. I mean, you know, this is an indictment not so much on how much people want to eat as on how much we can afford to raise, uh, to bring them uh, in product at a price that, uh, that, that will cover our costs. And as costs have gone up, we've reduced and reduced and reduced the amount that we've offered. And in addition, we've had export customers who have generally outbid U.S. domestic customers on many for many of these items, and thus reduced the domestic supply uh, available. And and and, and to, to point that out, I said, if people don't want to eat meat, when well, then why are they paying so much for it? Okay, we just had record prices for both beef, a choice beef, and all fresh beef in the December uh, retail price. Uh, the, I mean, the November de retail price data. The December was released yesterday, and I don't think I got, I, I didn't get to look at it. Uh, we had record prices for pork back in the summer, and we had record prices for, for chicken in October. Uh, it's not that people don't want to eat meat. It's that we can't afford to bring them as much as they would like them to, to eat at a price that they can afford to eat it. And if we look at expenditures for meat, this, the last year, observation here is 2011, record high. So, you know, that doesn't tell me that people don't want to eat meat. It's just that costs have gone up and uh, we've had to extract more and more dollars out of those consumers to get this product moved. When we get 2012 data, it will be a new record. Uh, I'm pretty confident on that one. Okay, let's talk about uh, supply issues, on uh, some things from our comp competition. Talking about the other species under the demand section because that's where they impact us. I mean, uh, you know, it'd be nice, you know, there's not really a lot of impact, but where, where it really has an impact on your bottom line is when the price of chicken either goes up and causes somebody to substitute pork or goes down and encourages them to eat chicken instead of pork. In this case, we've seen the chicken business reduce supplies pretty steadily over the last few years, certainly reduce their breeder flock. The breeder flock in October was the smallest it had been since November of 1996. Now that's the good news. The bad news is that in December it increased by about 2%. And that is an unusual occurrence. Normally the breeder flock goes down in December relative to November or at least stays the same. It increased a little bit and we've seen some reports of some positive financial uh, results from a few broiler companies over the last couple of months which tells me that this business may be turning the corner and going back in to some expansion mode even though that probably won't come to bear real quickly. We look at broiler egg sets, of course, they were well below year, earlier levels the first half of 2012. They just basically were at year earlier levels for the second half of the year. The first year of this year, egg sets, first week of this year, egg sets were up 1.6% from a year ago. On the side of chick placements, the same is true, of course, lagged about three weeks. This year, placements were up 1.2% the first week of the year. So uh, we could see some shift back to expansion here on the broiler business. Now, were they, all those reductions in placements and, and, and chick placements were eaten up by growth in weights, especially in the fourth quarter. I don't think that's gonna stop anytime soon. The first, uh, the first week of the year, uh, weights were up at 4.35 pounds, 2.4% uh, higher than a year ago. The estimated broiler cutout was amazingly steady last year. Uh, we, we can, compute this every week using uh, chicken part yields and part prices and you can see we're starting the year off uh, well up into the 90s. I think you're going to see this number trade up maybe 104 or 5 in the summer. Uh, we're looking for a pretty robust market on chicken especially even if they start increasing uh, output now it shouldn't have a huge negative impact so that could be positive for pork uh, as we go through the summer. Chicken summary companies appear to be moving back to expansion. expansion. The breeder flock grew in December. Egg sets placements close to last year levels, but they've started this year. Uh, pardon me, they were close to last to 2011 levels last year. They've started this year higher already. I don't expect much growth, uh, and it just won't be huge, but still uh, probably enough growth 
that uh, with exports and with growth population, I think per capita chicken supplies will still be down slightly as we go through 2013, uh, being a, a positive thing for prices, probably record high prices that are going to be positive for pork. On the cattle side, um, what you want to do in the cattle business and what Mother Nature lets you do in the cattle business are sometimes two different things. And that is the case that we see in this business. They had moved a couple of years ago to start expanding the cow herd and then along came the, the drought of 2011 in the southwest and then the dry conditions of this last year that's left about 55 percent of the acres in the United States rated as poor or very poor. Uh, notice here's where we were a year ago. Now most of those were in Texas and Oklahoma and New Mexico. This much more widespread. Uh, the cow inventory uh, in July, the smallest since 1946. If we look at the calf crop last year, the smallest since 1949, and a increased rapid uh, reduction of the calf crop last year. If we look at feeder cattle supplies uh, over the last three years, down 1.7, 2.7, forecast to be down 3.3% uh, on, on July 1 this year. Uh, just tighter and tighter cattle supplies. If we look at placements, uh, these are feedlot placements by month. Uh, we had a big surge of those in 2011 because of dry conditions. Uh, this last year, uh, we had some calves placed in the summertime because of that, but look what's happened in the last five months. Well below a year ago, and it's left feedlot inventories down about 6% uh, versus a year ago. So as of December 1, there were 700,000 fewer cattle in feed yards than there were a year before. And uh, at some point here, uh, we're going to see this come back as lower fed cattle supplies and much tighter supplies on cattle. Uh, what are we going to do as far as, as, as cutouts? I've got the cutout charger somewhere. Um, you know, I, I've, I thought we were going to have $200 cutout values on the choice cutout for about a year, so I figure if I keep saying it long enough, I'll eventually be right. Um, and uh, that's the way it is with economics, I guess. But still, uh, I don't think there's much question we're going to see this. Now, there's been a lot of talk, well, consumers won't buy beef to, to, to support a $200 cutout. And my reaction always has been, yeah, some consumers will, not all of them. And that's the reason that those ones that won't, won't be buying because there isn't enough beef out there to feed them anyway at prices that are that low. So I think we're going to have these, these prices trade up above $200. If you notice, historically, we've had about a $12, $14 rally from the first of the year into April. You add that onto here and you put us up here somewhere around uh, 210, 212 on the, on the choice beef cutout. Uh, F beef cow slaughter last year was down 12.4% from the large levels of 2011. But the point to make here is that even in the fall, we were killing enough cows that we were reducing, probably reducing the cow herd. Uh, I don't know what the, Don, what's the cow inventory going to say when we get the, the January report? Down another 1%, 2%? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I don't think there's much question about that. And we were still probably liquidating this cow herd as we went through the fall, even though there were some real, very big profit prospects out for 2013. Uh, beef consumption, uh, again, instead of U.S. beef consumption, think of this as U.S. beef availability. Because remember that consumption is production plus uh, beginning inventories plus imports minus imp exports minus inventories is disappearance. We don't know where it went. We assume somebody consumed it or somebody's dog or whatever, but still, uh, this is how much is available. And if that's the case, then prices are going to be higher and it should be very positive for pork as we go through this year. So there's the summary. Weights are going to remain high. Now, we don't have as many cattle, but they're going to be big. And Zilmax, Optiflex are certainly having the impact on that. Lower cattle numbers partially offset by weights, but lower beef supplies uh, probably to the tune of around 4% or so this coming year. Cow slaughter remains high relative to the herd, and that's really an issue of availability of forage and whether it rains. Uh, you know, if you kept cows going into the winter, you pretty well know how to get them through the winter. But once the winter is over, if it doesn't rain in some of these areas, there's not going to be much there to feed cows. Longer term, tighter and tighter per cap supplies. Uh, and I think this has got a long tail, way 2014, 2015. It takes a long time to change the beef business. And the question I'm putting out there is, will beef cease to be a habit for everyone below the middle class? And I'm not talking T-bone steaks here. I'm talking ground beef as well as, as some other things. I mean, it could be very expensive 
uh, for, for some consumers. Okay, pork exports, November, down a little bit from October, uh, still up 5.6% year to date, virtually assuring us of another record year. Uh, still, uh, we were down, uh, October shipments were down almost 8% from a year ago, but we got to remember that November of last year was the record on a carcass weight basis ever. If we look at the markets as we're going to, of course, China, Hong Kong was 59% lower than a year ago. It's still up for the year slightly, about 2%. Uh, Mexico uh, up 15%, Canada up 17 uh, Russia's the light blue line here was up 46% uh, this year versus a year ago, year to date. Now we've obviously run into a few challenges there with uh, the Russians, uh, in my opinion, re retaliating for some things, uh, some uh, human rights uh, clauses that were put in that permanent normal trade relations bill uh, over ractopamine. Um, that's life with the Russians. I mean, that's the way they deal. And so we should have expected that. And actually we should have seen, well, gee, Pork exports are up 47% to the Russians. They're going to do something. I mean, that's kind of the way they react. So um, uh, it's not a surprise to me. It does take out a market here, at least in the short run. Uh, but I still think we're going to have very good exports next year. We're in a very good competitive position. On the exchange rate side, two things to look at here. Number one is that the, uh, the real lost significant value in late 2011 to 2012. It's been pretty stable since then but it does give the Brazilians a cost advantage in some markets. The other one is the devaluation of the yen over the last uh, three or four months. Uh, that takes some buying power away from the Japanese. Now, we've had very good shipments to Japan, still our highest volume uh, pork market, uh, our highest value pork market, and our highest volume muscle cut market, uh, but still we have to be a little bit concerned about that. What's gonna happen with world supplies? Uh, this is a $64 question to some degree too. Uh, notice that China is on the right chart, that's the red line. If you put China on the same scale as everyone else, all these lines would all be together down here at the bottom. Okay? There are just so many more pigs there, ten times as many as we have. Their slaughter is forecast by the Foreign Ag Service to be constant. The one to really pay attention to, to me, is this one right here, EU27. FAS has EU slaughter the same in 2013 as in 2012, exactly the same. Now, when I've talked to people that spend a lot more time with Europe than I do, I've heard anything from 2 to 5% reduction in slaughter. But I've also observed that prices in Europe have been quite strong. So I don't know exactly where this is going to land. Uh, uh, probably the minus 5 to no change is a good bracket on it, but it's going to be important for exports. If they have a 5% reduction in slaughter there, it's certainly going to open some opportunities for U.S. product. If it's steady with last year, it's going to be a much more competitive situation in export markets going through. We look at the others. This is this collection down here with the big three thrown out. Uh, we can see growth by Brazil, no surprise there. Uh, some growth by Russia as well. Uh, this would be the blue line here. And of course, Russia is trying to become self-sufficient. and It's one of the motivators of this situation with ractopamine. Canada, a slight reduction in slaughter in 2013. The other is kind of uh, steady as she goes. I thought it was, uh, here's the recovery of Korea after their foot and mouth disease outbreak. Probably a little more robust recovery than what I expected. So demand summary. The indexes are now positive for 2012. If they end up the year, that'd be the first time ever for all of them to be positive. None of them are robustly so, but still uh, not a bad result. A lot better result than I think we were looking at mid-summer. Exports are expected to grow. Another record this coming year. Uh, I think exchange rates are going to be very important to that, and of course what happens in the EU. Higher beef and chicken prices, and I put question mark by chicken, I think they still will be higher, but not nearly as much as what I thought six months ago. Positive for pork demand. Uh, my biggest concern still is consumer income and expenditures. We still have to sell 77% of this product we're producing here in the United States. So it really matters uh, what people have to spend on those products. Okay, hog supplies. The December hogs and pigs report came out, and lo and behold, the breeding herd was larger than it was a year ago, and about 1% higher than the uh, analyst had thought going into that. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, I think uh, if you'd watched this high, the sow slaughter data and the guilt retention data pretty closely for the fall, uh, you would have thought probably that this 99.3 expectation was too low. Uh, we had a number at about 99.8, so we were still down a little bit, but not very much. Uh, the market heard at 100% of a year ago and noticed that 
Virtually all the numbers were 1% larger than what was expected. And so a bit of a bearish surprise in that, surprise in that report, no doubt. Uh, the, the, the real thing to figure out on this, though, is where is the difference coming? Because it's hard to do. We did have a return, 1.3% growth in litter size. Uh, maybe a little slowing of the 2% growth pattern we had for about four years, but still a pretty robust gain in productivity. Uh, normally when I have these, I usually use last year's slaughter number and do a percent change and, and fudge them a little bit uh, from time to time. But last year's slaughter pattern on a weekly basis was so screwy that you kind of had to go back to the drawing board to come up with this coming year. And we were short in the summer because of heat, hot weather. We were very long in the August and September because of some delayed hogs and some hogs pulled forward uh, trying to avoid uh, feed costs. Uh, so what I did was I went back and kind of normalized uh, that slaughter pattern. And that would be the brown line that you see here. And then applied the percent changes from the December hogs and pigs report. Now the surprise out of this to me was when I first looked at the hogs and pigs report, I thought, oh man, we're going to have more hogs in the fourth quarter. But when I went back and said, hmm, let's look at a normal kind of seasonal pattern, the real big year-over-year -year increases will be June, July, and August. And in the fourth quarter, we'll actually be slightly below where we were a year ago. And so uh, this pattern is kind of up in the air, but I was really encouraged last week because last week's number came out right on top of what my forecast was. <laughs> we, we dance when that happens at our house. Uh, but anyway, um, I, yeah, I don't have very many victories, so I'm going to claim that one. Um, but still, for the year, slightly higher slaughter, no reductions for sure, is what I kind of look at right now based on the December hogs and pigs report, and with most of the increase being here and right in the dead of summer. Okay, uh, some reductions in May and some reductions in the fourth quarter relative to this year, certainly in August and September when we had that big push to change weights. We look at weights, we're still about two pounds below uh, last year's level. That's, we ran anywhere from three to four pounds on these barrels and gilts. This is producer sold barrels and gilts here in the fourth quarter. I think we're going to stay somewhere two, two and a half pounds below until we get to the point where A, feed costs go down. <laughs> Who thinks that's going to happen between now and September? I don't really. Or B, it warms up and slows pigs down. Okay? Uh, then we'll probably get some changes here going back. But I don't think we're going to have much change in these, uh, in these uh, uh, weights relative to a year ago here for the first quarter, quarter and a half as we go through 2013. FI pork production a little bit higher last week, uh, up 1.8%. Uh, that's, of course, higher slaughter by about 3%. Higher weights ate into that, uh, lower weights ate into that. We're going to have that same kind of relationship for much of, the, much of this year, especially through April. When we get into May, I think you're going to see pork production go down because slaughter will be below a year ago, and we still might have lighter weights. The pork cutout value begins this year in the low 80s. If we see the same kind of normal seasonal pattern, that would take us from 65 up to 85. That would put us somewhere here at around $100 for the summer high. Uh, we think that's a pretty reasonable number. Now, last year, you can see we had nothing like a normal seasonal pattern on the cutout value. Uh, I don't know if there ever is a normal seasonal pattern in any given one year, but still, uh, that's the kind of prices we're looking on the cutout value, and it should uh, come back over into, into uh, hog prices that are generally somewhere in the mid-90s as we go through the summer, uh, in the mid-80s as we go through the first quarter, and then back again down toward $80 in the fourth quarter. Uh, slaughter forecast for this year quarterly. Uh, I have the third quarter up 1.2%, but that would be a negative number, except that the third quarter has one more slaughter day in it this year, and it did last. So uh, you have to adjust for that. Still, slightly higher slaughter the first half of the year, a bit lower in the second half, actually, as uh, we go through. Uh, you can see my forecast compared to the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Iowa State, and the University of Missouri. We're all up, uh, you know, uh, LMIC's got it down 1% fractional increases by uh, Mizzou, Iowa State, and myself on total year slaughter. And here's our quarterly forecast. I'm forecasting national net negotiated prices. Um, Mid-80s, first quarter, low, uh, around $90 a second, up into the mid-90s for the third quarter, and back down into the mid-80s here. The annual average, uh, about 5% higher, mainly because, A, larger exports, 
uh, some lower weights in the first half of the year should keep uh, uh, production down some. Growing population, we're going to have lower per capita supplies. As a matter of fact, we'll have one of the lowest per capita consumption figures probably in about 40 years uh, this coming year for pork in the United States, somewhere around 46, 47 pounds. Uh, sow slaughter, um, we're still running relatively low sow slaughter. If we look relative to the five-year average, uh, I think we're not in any kind of mood to be reducing this sow herd, probably increasing it. And if you look at what's happened with gilt slaughter as a percentage of the total, I think it really tells the story on what that December 1 hog, uh, sow herd came out. I mean, we've been running well below, except for this surge in September, we've been running well below the long-term average on percentage of the slaughter made up of gilts, meaning that some of those gilts were being laid back, and that dates back to October, and I think that's really where the growth in this sow herd has come. My model says finances are weak. This is accumulated profits, and many of you have seen this. It got up to about $800 from selling one pig per month and putting that profits into an account. This would be the balance. Got up to $800, of course, during the big cost changeover in 07, 08, it went down dramatically. Here's what the futures say it's going to be. Back in July, that number went negative. So it's better than it was then, but it's certainly gone down. Uh, I had thought from this number that we just didn't have the financial wherewithal to stand what we saw last summer. And uh, with some bankers and others that I've talked to, you know, uh, they don't think the financial standards was this bad. Now, I will say this. I think that we have enough to stand this hit from the market, from the grain market, but I'm not sure there's enough there to stand another one. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure there isn't. And so uh, we're still in a pretty precarious place going into this spring, so it's really important what we have. What, why are you holding on? And I say that you to producers. Well, the futures, especially for next, for next summer, up until just recently, look very, very good. And there are some people who took advantage of that to lock in at least small losses for the coming year, and so I think that really put them in a position to break even and survive. Uh, the financial position was better than what this chart tells us, because this is all based on cash buying of grain and cash selling of hogs. And many of you have become much more adept at managing risk over the last few years, and that uh, certainly has helped you. Uh, uh, this is what I do. I mean, you know, I know a lot of you, and you're hog producers, and you're going to stay hog producers, and you're going to stick with this as long as you can. And so there's a mentality to, to hang on. And finally, everyone's betting on rain. And the bets in this situation are huge. I just don't see how many can survive another dry 13. Now, the good news is that usually doesn't happen. Uh, but if it does, I think that massive liquidation that some were talking about last summer, we'll see as we go through the summer. Long-term issues, cost, 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 equal prices, prices, prices. Uh, you know, how good is our consumers going to be good at paying these higher prices for all the products? Uh, animal welfare, of course, you've got cha chronic challenges there. Uh, the stall issue, uh, we don't view it as being logical. Uh, I feel like we've made some headway in teaching some people about uh, the good things of stalls. I don't know if it's enough to overcome what they think is bad things behind stalls, but I feel like we've made some headway. Uh, castration is the next one really on the docket. Tail docking is going to be a big issue at some point. All of these are going to have to be dealt with. Um, ultimately, though, I think you know, we're going to see this come back and they're going to start taking shots completely in indoor production. Uh, I'm very concerned about that because, you know, when I talk to somebody about antibiotics that, that doesn't know anything about them, someone from the city or something that, or, that doesn't, uh, one of the things that they'll end up saying is, well, if you didn't have all those hogs indoors, you wouldn't have to use those. Now, I've raised hogs outdoors and I can tell you that mine got sick outdoors, too. Maybe I just wasn't very good at it, but still. Uh, we know that, and we know, and I'm confident that pigs are better off with most of our confinement systems, but I think this is the ultimate place where a lot of this is headed, and we need to be ready for that. Risk management skills are going to be very important. Of course, policy, always something there. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on about the use of antibiotics and limitations on there. The farm bill have been put off because of the fiscal cliff uh, debates. I, I don't know that we have as much at stake there this year. I, I'm not sure we're going to have a livestock title that has been the source of some problems in the past with country of origin labeling and some of those kind of things. Uh, but still, policy things are going to be a big deal. Last point I want to talk about real quickly, and I didn't have a slide. 
Um, mandatory price supporting for pork, wholesale pork products uh, began uh, earlier this year. Uh, USDA started publishing those prices one week delayed uh, on Monday. We have the reports now for January 7th, 8th, and 9th. I would encourage you to go to the AMS website, uh, Livestock Market News, and take a look at those. Um, they're an important step. Uh, why are they doing it one week delay? Well, um, that was one of the things that was decided by the group that negotiated those rules in a negotiated rulemaking process last year. And the real interest here is to try to keep the voluntary system alive for a while so that we can compare the data being generated under mandatory to the data being generated under the voluntary and that way buyers and sellers of pork products will know how to adjust their formula prices and their contractual prices. If you just quit one cold turkey and start on the other one, you don't know how it related to what you used to be doing. And so that's the reason for the one week delay. There's going to be more and more talk, some more talk about this. USDA had said they're going to do that until January 28th and then they're going to just go right ahead. Uh, the trade has asked them to back off of that and let's run these things parallel for a longer time period to get a better feel. So watch for some developments on that. If you look, if any of you looked at the reports, it's pretty remarkable. There's a lot of products that have had prices published on those first two or three reports. Uh, I, I kind of did a count in the Daily Livestock report that uh, was uh, sent to you last night, those of you who subscribed. Um, uh, I can't remember the numbers. 24 prices on the voluntary, uh, something like 80 different products with prices on the mandatory. I mean, it was remarkable how many more products that we had prices reported for. Uh, instead of one belly quote, we had prices on nine different belly products in the mandatory. So it will not cover all of the product because there are a lot of products that don't ever get traded. They're processed within house and those kind of things, but it's going to increase the volume and the breadth of what we know about the wholesale market. The good thing is it should end up eventually, for producers, you should end up with a cutout value, an estimated cutout value that I think is far more, we can have a lot more confidence in and probably represents the trade better than what we have now uh, with the voluntary system. And that's really the goal and that's the reason that producers have been behind uh, adding pork to